This is Matthew McConaughey. Natalie Portman. James Patterson. Michael Ian Black. And you are listening to Five Questions with Dan Chabell. Kevin, welcome to Five Questions. Thank you. Thanks for having me, man. I've got five answers. They're going to be very long. I love that. And honestly, it's, it's such a pleasure to have you on the show. How did witnessing your father despising his post office job in your childhood impact your career and life decisions? Is that question one? That's question one. Um, I didn't know <laughs> we were just doing standard chit chat before the real questions kicked in. I was like, wow, <laughs> deep went fast. Um, I bet that's what they all say to you then. Um, all right, here's how my father's life as a postal employee affected my life as a filmmaker. My father hated going to his job every damn day of his life. He worked the night shift at the post office. So he wasn't the letter carrier. He was the guy who would go to the sectional center and cancel your stamps. So it was a soul killing job, you know, a number pusher. He worked a machine, a sorter, and he hated the job. He went in all piss and vinegar when he started. And after the first week, a few of the dudes that worked uh, with him uh, approached him and they were like, hey, slow down, man. It's the mail. And so, you know, he was encouraged to not be his best, but to be less than his best. And rather than pursue another job or career, my father's work wasn't important to him. It was just to pay for his family. Like he wasn't those like, what do I want to be in life? He, he wanted to be married and have kids. And this job, the post office paid for that. So he suffered through it, but this job was the bane of his existence. And whenever he wanted to like not go in at night, um, you know, cause he would wake up at nine o'clock at night, by 10 o'clock he left the house and by, you know, it took a half an hour to get to his job. And then he sat in the parking lot for a half hour, psyched himself up, I guess. And then 11 o'clock he started the job. And then he was done at seven o'clock in the morning. When he didn't want to go to work, he would ask my mom to call in for him. She, Grace, will you call in? And my mom, first, when I was younger, she'd be like, yeah, yeah, of course. She liked to have him around. The older he got, you know, the more he wanted to call in. My father was working since he was 16 years old, maybe 14. Me and my brother were trying to figure it out. So by the time he reached that age, he was just like, I don't want to work anymore, man. The kids are all out of school. Like, so he started calling out more and more, started trying to enjoy his life. And he had poor health, so he had good reasons to call out. He's lifelong diabetic. So my mom one day was just like, I'm not calling out for you. Like, yeah, that's it. Like, you got to do it yourself, Don. Like, grow up, be a man and call out yourself. And my father would never do it. It was the bane of his, his existence. He was terrified of making this call. So he turned to me, the youngest, the only one who was left in the house when the sister and brother went to college. And he was like, will you make the call for me? And I was like, yeah, absolutely. I, I, I couldn't wait, man. I'd heard, I've been on the one end of this phone call my whole life, seeing my father terrified of the great and powerful Oz that was on the other side of this phone. So my father instructed me, he was like, this is what you say. You do not volunteer any more information than this. You say Don Smith is, Smith is sick and he's not coming in today. If they ask you questions, look to me and I will whisper prompts. And I was like, okay. So we called the number. It rings three times. My dad is standing there staring at me as if like, you know, we're calling a kidnapper to get my mother back or something like that. And this was the phone call, the exact phone call. They go, um, dispatch. I go, yes, Don Smith is not going to be in today. And I was about to say he's sick. And then the guy goes, okay, and hung up. And that was that. My father lived in fear of that phone call. I watched him my whole life beg other people to make that phone call, terrified to deal with what was on the other end of that phone. And then when I called it, it was a guy who was indifferent at best. Like, you know, I doubt he even wrote my dad's name down. It's the post office. They didn't care. So that shaped me a great deal where I was like, I don't want to do that. I don't want to live my life in fear of some faceless voice on the other end of the phone that could fire me at a moment's notice if, if I decide to call out or something like that. So it, I, it wasn't like a, a vow I made in childhood, like, you know, Batman made over the death of his parents, like this will never happen to any other kid. But I remember being like, you know, it's worth taking a risk doing something cool than like just to back into a job that is going to shape my existence and I'm going to hate it. My father hated working at the post office. So that to me shaped a, a great deal of what I'd become. Um, I, I figured I'd rather risk a career in, in, you know, the unlikely entertainment field and hope that works out than just immediately go into the, 
the job market like my dad did and work for somebody else. Like I was always, I knew I was never cut out to work for some other asshole. I was like, there's one asshole I can work for and that's me. Yeah, that's really well said and told. And I feel like we either follow in our family's footsteps or we rebel against it. It's like when someone's uh, father or mother is like a doctor, a lawyer, or accountant, you know, sometimes they do the same thing or have the same career. And other times we're like, I see they're work, you know, my dad or mom's a lawyer and they're working like a hundred hours a week and they're unhappy. I'm going to try something else. And it seems like you modeled, you know, you kind of rebelled against that path that you saw for your dad. And that's so powerful. Like I, I remember early in my career, I was driving home after an eight hour training class where I had to learn about like thousands of technology products that I still didn't even understand. And I was like, there's got to be something else for me in this life. And that kind of set me on a path. So I think we all have triggers and it seems like that was a trigger for you. Like, I don't want to end up this way. There's got to be a better path for me. And let me be honest with you. I work harder now than I ever would have if I just did my father's job. Like I, every day I get up and have to recreate Kevin Smith and the Kevin Smith business to attract customers, to make people interested. I'm long in the tooth. I've been doing this for nearly three decades. So like nobody coming to Kevin Smith going like, he's going to surprise and delight me. Like I'm old hat at this point. And so it's more work to keep that career going than it would be if I was literally just working for somebody and punching a clock and doing what was expected of me. But no regrets. I'd rather work eight times as hard being Kevin Smith for a living then have it easy just working for somebody else as a nondescript person. Anybody could fill that job potentially. The job I have right now is professional Kevin Smith. And I know that only one person could fill that role. And that's me. Absolutely. And we are both really into comics and NFTs. I collected comics as a kid and now I'm bu buying Marvel and DC NFT collectibles and comics on Vivi. I literally have the first edition, uh, Spider-Man, first appearance, Batman, first appearance, Superman here. And it's like, brings me back to my childhood and I just have fallen in love all over again. Uh, how did you originally get into comics and how did they inspire your many projects and productions over time? First time I read a comic book. Um, now, mind you, I was familiar with the characters from Super Friends and uh, Batman, the, the 66, the Batman TV show. So I was very familiar with uh, the Spider-Man cartoons, familiar with the characters, but never read a comic book until I was five years old. My father took me to Vinny the Barber. That's where my dad would get his haircut. And so he's like, it's time for you to go to Vinny and get your haircut. And, uh, you know, I was a kid, so they put a wooden board on the barber chair to sit me up, you know, so they could reach my head. So while he was cutting my dad's hair, he was like, there are comic books under the TV, if you want to read them. And that was my first exposure to a comic book, was Hot Stuff, The Little Devil, Sad Sack, which was an army comic like Beetle Bailey. And then uh, Batman, the cover, the detective cover that has the Joker holding Batman on a giant playing card. Uh, as a stoner, I always forget that issue number. And uh, Spider-Man, and it was Spider-Man fighting the Beetle. So I knew these characters from other media didn't realize like, oh my God, I could read about them like every week a new comic book comes out. So I got into comic books at age five, six, seven. When I went to high school, I put comic books away. I was a big Marvel zombie when I was a kid. Uh, my favorite comic of all time back then was the handbook of the Marvel universe, which wasn't technically a story. It was more a catalog and encyclopedia of Marvel characters, but it was so thrilling because as you read about all their powers and abilities, you made up stories in your head. You know, when you were reading somebody else's story, you were following along. Reading about the characters and their abilities, you're like, oh my God, well, if Bullseye could throw like a paper clip and kill somebody, like what else would be a lethal weapon in his hands and stuff like that? So I loved comics, but then when I went to high school, this was at a time when uh, comic books were not celebrated by the mainstream, by any stretch of the imagination. And people would put you down and be like, what are you, a kid? Why are you reading that stuff? Why do you care about that stuff? Sports! Sports were real big when I was a kid. So I put it away going into high school. Coming out of high school, it was my friend Walter Flanagan, who was the star of our show Comic Book Men, who ran Jay and Silent Bob's Secret Stash. He was the one, he was older than me by like two, three years, a much cooler kid than me, very metal. He loved comic books. He had a mullet and a denim jacket with a, a you know hardcore metal band artwork on the back, painted on the back and stuff. But he loved comic books and made no apology about it. 
you know, no apologies whatsoever, no excuses. Like uh, I remember he got me into it because I was like, this guy is this. this I, I've written a report about Batman my senior year in high school. And so I was working at this Highlands Recreation Center. And the only thing I knew about my coworker, Walter Flanagan, was that he liked comic books. And we hadn't spoken in the six months that I worked there other than about the job itself. So in an effort to reach out to him, I was like, hey, man, you know, I wrote a Batman report my senior year in high school. And he's like, yeah. And I was like, yeah, I'll bring it in. Then you can read it. He didn't ask. I just forced it on him. So I brought it in, gave it to him. And then the next day he was like, I read that report. You don't know anything about Batman. It's all based on the TV show and the cartoons. Like, you don't know anything about the comics. And Anne Harriet's not even a character in the comics. He's going here. And he gave me a copy of Dark Knight Returns, Frank Miller's seminal work. Rolled up trade paperback that was in his back pocket. He just carried it around like a gunsling. You know what I'm saying? Like people walking around, he'd encounter people who had never read Dark Knight Returns. He'd be like, ignorance, knowledge. And he would just hand you this book. So I took it home and read it and I fell in love. I was like, this is what comic books are now? They had taken a big jump in my absence, man. They were grown up stories. The comic books of the mid to late eighties are still my favorite, man. The Alan Moores, the Neil Gaiman's, the Grant Morrison's, the Frank Miller's, the, the Matt Wagner's, like people that were taking these characters, making dark stories with them. They weren't happy super friends anymore. They were, how do you live with these powers and abilities and stuff like that? So I got way into comics at that point. And I remember Walter was like, you know, because I, I, I said, what about the people that th think we're kids, we're childish for reading this? He's like, I'm immature for reading this. I'm stupid for reading The Watchmen. He's like, they're stupid. They didn't read The Watchmen. The Watchmen's an amazing piece of literature. They don't know that. So who's dumb, me or them? And he was the guy that kind of gave me spine about comic books and you know boom i was back in we would go to shows every weekend we would go to comic book stores every week fantasy zone in uh, red bank new jersey which was staffed by dave windorf who went on to be the lead singer of monster magnet years later and stuff so it was this glorious age golden age of rediscovery you know all these stories and characters that i knew from childhood like there were new stories and they were grown-up stories and like iron man was a drunk and like you know, Batman was a dark Avenger. He wasn't just the smiley, you know, campy uh, partner of Robin. So I loved it. I loved what, what had gone down in the field. They start bringing in British writers and things got real grown up and stuff. So I, I became a hardcore collector at that point, hardcore acolyte. Um, and then Prophet as well, you know, uh, like quite like uh, Saul. I was struck down on the road to Damascus by the voice of God. And the voice of God, of course, was Stanley. And I rose up as uh, Kevin Smith, and, and suddenly I was preaching the gospel of Marvel and DC, mostly DC back in the day. I was a huge DC kid, but the Marvel movies have made me more of a Marvel fan uh, than the comics ever did, to be honest with you. Yeah, I interviewed Stan Lee before he died, actually, and he was just so cool. He's just one of those people that, regardless of how old you are, who you are, where you live, like he'll be able to connect with you and make you laugh, and I thought that was just so special about him. Um, also, like I was obsessed growing up with the whole, uh, I don't remember if you know, is the Nightfall, Night Quest, Night End Batman series, which Batman. is most famous for Bane breaking uh, Batman's back and like that hologram on, on the additional flap cover. I would beg my grandfather and my mom to buy me, you know, the new series. And, the, and they're like, wait, there's another one? I mean, yeah, Bane let everyone out of prison and out of Arkham. So there's a lot of comics that I have to collect. And I'll always remember that. And uh, you know, I think it's about it's about the storytelling, the stories that never get old, the new stories that reinvigorate us. And then the idea that because they have weaknesses, you know, the reason why people obviously love Batman and obviously Superman with kryptonite is they're kind of human and they have human issues and thus they, they are relatable to us. But it's more they're also somewhat aspirational, like, you know, Bruce Wayne is really rich and is, is a massive philanthropist so that they're, they're able to do things we can't do but they're also like us at the same time and i think that makes it really special and their whole universe is being created now you know with the marvel movies and and some uh, what you've done with your movies too and it makes it even more interesting and has captivated people who would normally not read a comic book and i think that is something that i've i've been uh, paying attention to lately as well very true I, and honestly like people missed out if they didn't read comics as a kid and, and it's not too late you could always pick up graphic novels or, or weekly comics as an adult they're they're believe me they're not writing for kids anymore they're writing for us they're writing for adults but 
it appealed to me, comics appealed to me as a kid who was raised Catholic. Because, you know, my being raised in a faith, you're given a, a moral compass and do right, don't do bad. And we've got a book that's got stories about superheroes and bad guys. And, you know, we got the ultimate villain. Never mind Dr. Doom or Darth Vader. You got Lucifer himself, the fallen angel, Satan, for heaven's sakes. So I, I was really into comics as extended morality tales. They're far more interesting than the Bible. You know, way more colorful characters and way better outfits and whatnot. And in the Bible, you know, I think is uh, David slays Goliath with a slingshot and a rock. In comics, you literally get to watch Batman beat the shit out of criminals, like delivering justice to somebody who kills a child. You know, there's something very satisfying about that. So not only are you getting a strong morality tale about why it's better to be good than, than bad, but it's also appealing to the primal nature of like bad must be done away with. Like otherwise bad will keep happening. There are evil elements in the world and only some people are brave enough to stand up to them. We all fantasize about that stuff. It's not so much power fantasies about violence as it is power fantasies about being able to make things right. That's what superheroes want to do. It's not so much like, I want to beat the shit out of a stranger. It's all about making things right for someone they've never met before. In the case of Batman, no child will ever lose their parents in an alleyway like I did. So those stories appeal to, to uh, the young, the kid who was raised Catholic, you know, Christian with a strong kind of moral compass to do the right thing. Um, and, and also appeal to me just on the nature of like, when I started getting back into comics, in 1988, 89, they were fringe, bro. This was not the mainstream. This was nobody was making movies of this stuff. This was something that was like, you know, a garage band mentality. So like if you liked a small band that was yours and you're like, oh man, they signed with a major label and sold out or whatever else. That's what comics felt like. They belonged to you. They had been around for a long time, but the market had exploded and imploded and kind of reached this level of like, 100 to 200,000 was a bestseller or something like that. So you felt like you had something that you could share with others and it had tribal qualities to it because it attracted like-minded individuals and you could even break it into teams. I'm a Marvel guy, I'm a DC guy or something like that. But more importantly, like it gave you something to, to relate to other people about. You know, you could sit there and like, even though you have nothing in common, talk about shared comic book history. And suddenly you made new friends. Like one of the greatest friends I've ever had in my life, Walter Flanagan, came from comic books. And when I think of the best moments of our friendship, it's it's that. When I enjoy those Marvel movies, at the root of it, it's almost like being re-educated by Walt all over again in the late 80s, where he's like, here, this is Batman the Cult. Jim Starlin uh, wrote it, and Bernie Wrightson drew it. And it's about Batman dealing with a cult. There's no supervillain. There's just him dealing with like a Deacon Frost type character. Anytime I see a new Marvel movie or DC movie, it takes me back to those moments where sitting at the foot of my mentor, he was opening up a brand new world to me that I was still somewhat familiar with from childhood. Yeah, beautifully said. And I do think that also NFTs and new mediums that you're involved in are going to further you know, promote comics and the, the world of superheroes and villains to an even larger audience and get people excited about it again in new ways. Uh, when writing your book, Kevin Smith's Secret Stash, what are you most proud of and what would you have changed about your life story? Um, I, well, I mean, I don't know that I'm most proud of this, but I technically didn't have to write the book. I wrote a book before, Tough Shit, and I actually wrote that book, but this book was predicated on 20 hours of interviews that I did with Chris Prince over at Inside Editions. And then he transcribed it all down into the words in the book. So I said everything, but it's, you know, I didn't sit there and type out the actual words in the case of this book. But what did I feel going through it? Nothing but pride, man. Like, you know, I've been so busy moving forward in my career, like, you know, and keeping it going. Because I was flavor of the month. That's how I started, right? People were like, oh, look at this cute puppy did a magic trick, made clerks. What a good puppy. I wanted to keep that going forever. I didn't want to be a one hit wonder. I didn't want to be in and out of the room with just one flick. I, once I got into the room, so to speak, I wanted to stay there for my whole life. Like, I don't want to go back and work at Quick Stop and I don't want to work at the post office like my father. So the idea of like staying in the room, I got my foot in the door, but how do I get into the room and stay in the room is all about moving forward. It's all about producing. Like at the end of the day, you just got to make things. And so for decades, I just made things and never looked back. Like just I, or as we're finishing the one, we're setting up the other because I never wanted to be tossed out of the room, so to speak. 
And so doing the book gives me an opportunity to go like, all right, now I can look back because you have to. It's all about looking back. And when I do, like, I'm just filled with uh, an insane sense of gratitude. You know, all one thing has to go wrong. One person has to not be at a screening. One, you know, my dad doesn't go out with my mom and none of it happens. So when I look at the book and how full it is with all the projects I've done in my entire life over my career, I just think about how damn fortunate I am, how lucky I am that everything fell. Life is a lottery. It's not based on talent. I'm not like Wayne Gretzky, who was born touched by the hockey hand of God himself, innately knowing how to play that game. I'm the guy who wants to play. Don't have the natural ability. Boy, it looks fun. I'm a heart player, you know, not a true talent player. And so as far as I'm concerned, once I got in the room, I, I kept playing from the heart. I wanted to stay in that job. And so in looking back, I can look back at like now nearly three decades of, of a career and it doesn't read as desperate to me. While it was happening, it felt desperate. Like I was like, I gotta set up the next thing. If we don't set up the next thing, we won't get to make another movie. And then when I look at all between the pages of the book or the covers of the book, it seems so easy now. Like now it's like, oh, look at that. You can see the path. It charts very easily, but living it, it never seemed easy. It always seemed like it was fraught with peril or could go away at any moment's notice or something. So I was able to kind of set, step back and appreciate the story of Kevin Smith, which is something I've been telling for years and years, but to actually see it like laid out between pages and not like tough shit. Like when I wrote the book years ago and stuff, I knew what was there. This was, you know, I'd done 20 hours of interviews with Chris. So I didn't know what was going to be in the book. I didn't know all the pictures he had access to. I had some here. He came to the house and deep dived and a lot of the stuff that I have ephemera from going back to the beginning of my career, but he found other things. And then there was something I had no idea that was going to go on. He reached out to people and asked them to write little testimonials. And I was surprised by that by, by Ben Affleck. He texted me to be like, they told me to write a hundred words, but I had to write 1300 or something. And I was like, who told you, what are you talking about? It's like a Ford. <laughs> yeah. Yes. He was like the, the book. He's like, they asked me to write something. He's gone. I couldn't just write a little. So I wrote a bunch. And so, you know, it, it that was a surprise too. And a delight when I saw the, the PDF of the galleys, I was like, Oh my God, they got JJ. Oh my God. They got Walter. Oh my God. They got Scott Mosier. Um, like, Oh my, they got Seth Rogen. Like it was crazy that they reached out to these people and they took the time to say some nice things. So it just made me appreciative. I was glad that I had a book to show for it. My wife is a huge a book whore, man. She's a big bibliophile. She reads like three or four books a week. And this house is packed with coffee table books all over the joint. So the day I told her, I was like, they're doing a coffee table book on me. She was like, finally interested in Kevin Smith for the first time in like two decades. Cause she was like a coffee table book. This overlaps with my interests. And she's actually in it as well. So she likes it very much. So there was that I got bragging rights for it, but really it was a moment of respite where I could be like, I did it. Like, you know, I always feel very divorced from the kid who started the journey. Like I appreciate Kevin Smith so much. I'm, I'm, you know, this version of Kevin Smith, but I don't get to be that guy unless that version of Kevin Smith, the guy unlikely, the guy least likely to make a proactive decision in his life. He dropped out of college. He, he was, he was he never finished anything in his life, Dan. So the fact that that kid one day saw Richard Linklater slacker and was like, I think I could make a movie. And not only like fucking dreamed that he could do something that he had no experience doing, but followed through. He made all the difference in my life. I still make movies today for that kid. I don't have to make movies anymore because I, you know, I do a bunch of other things. So like I can interact with the public in so many different ways that doesn't put me, you know, in a judged position. When you make a movie that lets people go yay or nay. And, you know, I'm a very sensitive person and the nays always hurt. So to protect my own delicate ego, I should probably not make movies anymore, but I still do because that kid who started the journey, that's all he dreamed about. He didn't dream about being a podcaster. He didn't dream about writing a book or having a book composed of his entire life or doing masters of the universe or doing any of the stuff that I've done over the course of my career. That boy just wanted to be a filmmaker. And so to honor that kid that, made that brave decision and got us where we are today. I, I still make films just for him. 
Because if I go back in time and tell that kid, like, oh, you make a decision that makes my life so good, I don't even have to make movies if I don't want to, that kid would roll a tear. He's like, what do you mean? We could and you don't? Like, how could I explain to him that, like, the journey and the adventure is so much bigger than he could possibly conceive of right now? That kid, biggest he could dream was Clerks. What the life that that one decision wrought has been such an insane adventure. I would love to go back and tell that kid, like, you get your feet in the cement at the Chinese theater, kid. Like, you and that dopey-ass movie got so much mileage in the tank that one day you're ensconced next to Spielberg and 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 Ben. Well, no, Ben's not even there. I beat Ben into the cement, for heaven's sakes, which makes sense because I'm from Jersey. We always go into the cement. But stuff like that, I never imagined was a possibility, never dreamed of at the beginning of the Jersey, uh, of the journey from Jersey. So I love that kid. I love young Kevin Smith, man. He was so, so unbelievably confident that he could pull this off and he wasn't wrong. He was right. And it's he's just, still in you. Yeah. And he wasn't trying to make a great movie. That's the thing. He just wanted to make a movie. He'd seen so many people do it. And he was like, I want to do it. And he did it. And it changed everything. Love that kid. Yeah. Think about the journey, pursue it for the right reasons without worrying about the end result, because the end result will come if you do what you want to do and put the effort in. And I do like how you emphasize luck. A lot of people won't admit to that, but you can work as hard as you can. You can be as talented, like you said, as you can. At the end of the day, sometimes you have to be chosen or sometimes, you know, the audience just have to has to respond positively to you. And there's no guarantees on anything. There's no guarantees the next movie will do well or or anything, right? And so I think that that is really great for you too because it gives you kind of this this wider perspective and, and humbles you so that you know that, you know, you don't know what the future is going to hold, but you're happy that you were able to even make it this far in one of the, if not the hardest industries in the world. What I How I describe it uh, thusly, Dan, is I have been playing on house money since 1994 i i put up one initial bet on myself which was clerks and it paid off so well that i haven't had to go into like my own personal stash so to speak forever i've been playing on house money ever since and so i tend to treat the career like that some people would treat it more seriously and try to win oscars and get better at their job but you know i i didn't expect it to go this far every damn day i walk around the house and i'm like i can't believe it this is crazy because i know the origin story and i know the kid who got us here, man. And it was not manifest. It wasn't like written in the stars. It had a lot to do with luck and timing. Bob Hawk, um, who was a guy who was at the first screening we had of the movie at the IFFM. Nobody else was there. That dude was there. He was the one started telling people about this movie. Those people started calling me about clerks. That's how the world found out about clerks. If Bob Hawk's not in that theater that morning, October 3rd at 11 a.m. at the IFFM, Nobody ever hears about Clerks, except people in my life who every once a year I sit down and be like, let's watch the movie I made when I made the worst decision of my life and went into debt forever and something like that. So I'm well aware that luck and timing is a huge part of my story. Now, staying in the room, getting in the room, luck and timing is everything. Staying in the room, that takes dedication, that takes work. And I've been doing the work, man, good or bad, whether people like it or not. I've been doing the work since I had an opportunity. I never partied. Never like, you know, some people like once they get in, they're like, oh, my God, I'm going to take advantage and rock out with my cock out and shit. That was never for me. I, I was like, are you kidding me? Like, I'm in the room. I want to stay in the room. I don't want to mess this up. I'd seen and read stories about other filmmakers who like had a hit and then like kind of went off the deep end and stuff. I just wanted to keep my nose to the grindstone because I'm like, I know that I'm breathing rarefied air. Billion to one chance that I'm in the room right now. I'm going to stay in this room for the rest of my life. And in order to do that, I got to do the work. It's no longer about luck and timing. Luck always helps, but you've got to eventually do the work and show them that you belong in that room because they will bounce you. You know, they'll, they'll, it's a business full of frauds, but when they find out you're one, they have no problem showing you the door. Well, and you're, you're also thankful for your health. So it's not just your career too. How did having a heart attack and losing 50 pounds change your outlook on life? I tell you, having the heart attack changed everything in as much as, um, you know, I, I felt invincible, right? Like, I, I thought I was always the smartest kid in the room because of clerks. I had bragging rights. I was like, oh, my God, I'm so clever. I had an idea to make a movie, and I did it, and it started my whole career. And in that moment, like, what was born was a version of Kevin Smith who was like, 
well, I can do whatever I want now. I don't have to listen to anybody. And, you know, I wasn't like an asshole who wanted to bring down the system. I just wanted to eat cake for breakfast. I just wanted to eat what I wanted to eat. I didn't want to eat my vegetables. And so that's what I did. I lived my life the way I wanted to. And nobody said, well, Kev, you should probably eat better. They would say, hey, big guy, you know, and stuff like that. And I got bigger and bigger. Nobody would ever call me fat to my face. It was always like, ah, big guy. Hey, the big guy. Well, let's ask the big guy. And, you know, for me, I was like, I am the big guy because I created all this. But really, it was I was the physically big guy. I created physical mass for myself. So when the heart attack came, it saved my life. And it was one that, like, you know, is a widow maker. So I had an 83 percent chance of of dying, of not leaving the room. The doctor told me that during the procedure. Well, he told me 80 percent. And then Mick Garris later on told me because he had a widow maker, the director. He was like, no, it's 83 percent. You had a 17 percent chance of living that day, an 83 percent chance of dying. So when presented that information, you know, I had to get comfortable very quickly with the notion that I might not leave the operating room, that that ceiling was the last ceiling I was going to see. So I had to think about my life and kind of, you know, my life didn't flash before my eyes. I started the movie myself and I was so content. I was so happy with my life. You know, granted, I was 47 and I was like, oh, I'm going to die early, way earlier than my father, 20 years earlier than my father. But I was like, yeah, but at the same time, your life was so much more adventurous than your dad's. Like, look at all the crap that you did, man. Like, not only did you have wonderful parents and great brother and sister, you got married to a great woman and had a great kid. And, and that was just the personal shit. You had wonderful friends who you made art with. And you had this one in a million job and stuff like that. And you got to say whatever you wanted and express yourself and tell your dopey, dopey stories for millions of dollars. If this is the end tonight, if this is the price for all of that, just push back from the table, say thank you, be grateful, and go. Don't be the last guy at the party who's like, you got any more beer? It's like, the fun is over, time to go. So I got real at peace. It wasn't like an emo goth death wish where I was like, I can't wait to die. Man, 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 man. But I was like, I get it now. Honestly, what, what, what occurred to me as I was laying there, maybe this is how I had to cognitively reframe it to face my own death, was, oh, this is like when I graduated high school. Like it eventually had to end. I loved high school, man. I had a great time, but it eventually had to end. I couldn't stick around. I couldn't be like 20 in high school. That'd be bad. So I was like, this is graduation day. You're meant to do this. Like it's meant to come to a conclusion and you don't know what's on the other side, but like, why don't you be happy that you did it? Like, I'll be honest with you. I felt so relieved that I was going to die that night because I was like, I'm off the hook. I don't have to produce any more Kevin Smith movies. I don't have to keep this dog and pony show going or something like that. Like, I feel peace. This is going to be amazing. And then Leidenheim saved my life. And so at that point, I'm like, wow, I'm living on borrowed time. I was meant to die in that room. And in my head, I did die. I faced death and I was ready. But then, you know, Dr. Leidenheim had other ideas. So from that moment forward, I've, I've always felt like I've been living on borrowed time. Whenever I say it, my wife's like, that's so creepy. I was like, but it's it's not. I was like, you're living on borrowed time too. Act accordingly. I'm just painfully aware of it now by virtue of the fact that I went through something that ultimately wasn't even that painful. I wasn't in agony when I was having that heart attack. It's a silent killer, man. I would have died in very little pain. It wouldn't have been like, oh my God, Elizabeth, like Red Fox, you know, on Sanford and Son. It just would have, I just would have ended. And that would have been that. So the guy pulled me back, saved me. And at that point I was like, well, I'm living on borrowed time. Might as well not hold back and do all the things that I want to do. Never mind trying to govern your career by somebody else's standard, which I never really did, but still tried to try like, well, maybe I should do something, make a movie that makes money or something like that. Instead, I was like, just do what, just do you. You don't know how much time you got left to do you. Just keep doing you, man. And I felt old after the heart attack, Dan, very old. You can't help but feel that. You feel old and weak. And I knew the best way to feel young and vibrant again was to go up to the attic, pull out my old toys and start playing like I did when I was a kid. So Jay and Silent Bob reboot was the first movie I did after the heart attack. Dialed my clock back, man. I was young again. And then Clerks 3, which we just finished, total heart attack movie. Not only is it like, you know, a movie I wouldn't have gotten to make had I died from the heart attack, but I used the heart attack to fuel the movie. The plot of the movie is that Randall has a heart attack and that he decides like, hey man, I've watched movies my whole life. I got nothing to show for this life. I'm going to make a movie for a change. For the first time in my life, I'm going to self-express. I'm going to make a movie. So now my characters get to do what I did. Like, you know, made a movie, changed my life. Now they get to do the kind of same thing. 
nobody makes Clerks 3 hoping to get rich or win Oscars. They do it because they're like, I love my characters and I want to tell my heart attack story through the characters. I want to minimize that heart attack, turn it into a joke, a joke in a movie, a plot device. Because this is something that I remember when I had the heart attack, the doctors told me like, you may go through a bout of depression. I was like, why? They're like, because you're a middle-aged man who's just faced his own mortality. It happens all the time in about 50, 60% of the cases the heart attack victim goes through depression afterwards. And I couldn't wait for that to happen. I was like, I've never been depressed in my life. I can't wait to see what that's like. And it never came to pass because when I started feeling old or it started leaning in that self sorry, self pitying direction, instead I was like, no, use this. So I went out in the world and told the heart attack story over and over. One on Colbert did a seven minute version of it, but the longest, best version of it is an hour long story that details like what I went through and whatnot. And I road tested it, told it again and again, found every funny aspect of it. And then one day I was like, now it's useful. I'm going to put it into clerks. So I minimized it by turning it into a, an anecdote, a series of stories. And then I truly minimized it by making it happen to my characters and putting it into the flick. So when I watched the movie that we just made, and as I'm cutting it, very therapeutic for me, where I'm like, yeah, that heart attack wasn't no bad thing. You know, I'm glad it changed my life, but I didn't let it run my life and stuff. Whereas everyone else in my life, my wife and my kid watched the scenes in the movie where Randall has a heart attack. They shut down, they cry, they don't want to watch it. My wife's like, just show me the funny stuff. I was like, well, it's Clerks 3, it's all funny. She's like, no, the boy has a heart attack. I was like, number one, he's a man. And number two, I had a heart attack and I lived through it. That's why we're making this movie. And she's like, you had a different experience with the heart attack than I did. She's like, I'm glad it all worked out for you. But that was the day that I walked into the hospital and they said, do you have a will? And I thought you had died. She's like, so it's not a walk in the park for me. I'm glad it fueled your movie, but it's not the same experience. So for me, ever since the heart attack, you know, I've just kind of well aware of the fact that it ends. I'm not the smartest guy in the room. I shouldn't eat cake for breakfast, you know, left to my own devices. At least that was as self-destructive as I was. I didn't go down a drug path or, or, or something like that, or something, you know, physically detrimental, become a junkie or something like that. But I did become a sugar junkie. You know, for years I worked with Jason Muse on getting off heroin and stuff and would always shake a finger. Like, how can you be an addict when I was pouring sugar into my mouth and stuff? So, you know, I, I learned a lot of truths uh, from that heart attack and it provided me with material, gave me something new to talk about for the first time in years. I've been telling that clerk story over and over and over. And then one day I was like, hey, something else happened to me. I had a heart attack and I had some new content to talk about. But most importantly, it, it made me healthy, made me go like, you're not going to live forever. So start walking, start exercising, start eating vegan, eat less. And, and you know, I'm, I'll get a few more years to tell these goofy Kevin Smith stories. And I'll keep doing them until I go out toes up. And, and, you know, that means if it's something that's not written by me or something that I create, my characters, it's got to be super damn special. Because from now until the end, I just want to do Kevin Smith stuff. Yeah, thanks so much for sharing that. And, you know, I find a lot of creatives use their art for therapy. And, and it just seems like there's a, a great deal of gratefulness through your whole story and trajectory from your career to, you know, surviving a heart attack. So, um, what's your best piece of career advice? Best piece of career advice was given to me honestly by my, my sister. And it was so profoundly effective that it changed my life. I, we're having this conversation today because of this. So I saw Richard Linklater's movie slacker and I was suddenly very interested in indie film. I'm talking to my sister, my older sister, Virginia. She's five years older than me, but she looks five years younger. She's aged insanely well. Um, my brother is four years older than me. I was born on his birthday. Uh, so we share the same birthday. My sister is five years older than me to the week. She was born August 10th and stuff. So pretty close, although separated in age. And my sister was uh, always the artsy one and the dreamer and the you know world traveler and stuff. First one in our family to go to college and, and whatnot. So um, I talked to my sister about three weeks after I saw Slacker. And, you know, I'd secretly been fostering this dream ever since that night about like, maybe I can make a film. You know, I was very careful who I told because people have power and, you know, the right person could have talked me out of it. You know, if Walter Flanagan would have been like, if I would have been like, I want to make a movie. And Walter would have been like, that's stupid. I would have been like, you're right. That's stupid. Let's not do it. So I was very careful who I told. 
my sister I could trust. So she was always trying to get me to be a different version of myself, better version of myself, the best version of myself I could be. So like she would always try to get me to go to, she went to Est training courses, Earhart seminar training courses, which later on became landmark forum, self-improvement, kind of like the Tony Robbins shit where you self-actualize and whatnot. She was always trying to get me to do that. She was like, in, in high school, you were always like, you wrote sketches and you were in all the plays and she really should lean into that. So I told my sister um, about Slacker. I, I saw this movie called Slacker. I went to the city to see a movie. She's like, you went to Manhattan to see a movie? I was like, I know. Well, they ain't playing in any of the multiplexes here. I had to go up to the city, man. It was amazing. They serve coffee at that movie theater and biscotti. I hate them both, but I bought them because you never get an opportunity like that. So I saw this movie and I said, it made me want to be a filmmaker. So I want to be a filmmaker now. And my sister goes, great, be a filmmaker. And I go, yeah, that's, that's, that's what I thought. I saw the movie and I realized I could do it too. So I want to be a filmmaker. And she goes, good, then be a filmmaker. And I was like, that's what I'm saying. Yeah, you get it. That's what I'm saying. I, I want to be a filmmaker. She goes, no, just be a filmmaker. And I was like, what kind of Jedi mind trick shit is this? What are you talking about? What is, where's the communication breakdown? What don't you understand? She's going, you don't understand. I'm telling you to be a filmmaker. Don't want to be a filmmaker. Be a filmmaker. She's going, you're a filmmaker right now. You just haven't made your film yet. But as you proceed in life, no matter what you do, no matter what you're doing, if you're working a quick stop, how you perceive yourself, you now have to perceive yourself as a filmmaker who just hasn't had the opportunity to ply their trade yet. And it sounded like some, like, you know, to be fair, Tony Robbins bullshit, right? Like, just like, you are of the power, you know, follow your passion, whatever the fuck. J vague and general enough to be supportive, but not really earth shattering. But the next day, I said to myself, it don't cost anything to try. And my sister's smart. So, you know what? Okay. In my head and heart, I am not Kevin Smith who wants to be a filmmaker. I am filmmaker Kevin Smith. I'm a director. I just haven't directed yet. And God damn it, if that didn't make the difference, you know, there's a easier way to say it nowadays. They go fake it until you can make it. But she didn't tell me to be disingenuous. She told me to be who I was, to claim my power and my, and my name, my title. It's like, it's not enough to tell people like the story about how you want to do this one day. She's going, be it. You are it. And I, that made all the difference. Like, you know, especially when you're not that thing when nobody else is gonna perceive you as that thing. You have to perceive yourself as it first if you expect to convince others of that truth. I couldn't tell people or convince people I was a filmmaker unless I was a filmmaker. And so be a filmmaker, best piece of advice I ever got in my life. It doesn't mean be a filmmaker for everybody. Be that thing that you say that you want to be or do. And in being it, you have to produce a result. One can't happen without the other. It's not just talk. It's like in order to be it, you have to physically show a person or people that you can be that thing. So it makes you have to do this thing that you dream of doing one day. One day is for other people, kids. One day is for people with the luxury of time eternal. You don't have one day. You have today. Today is the moment that you start your journey toward the rest of your life. You start doing that thing that you're like, I want to be that. I want to do that one day. Today's that day. I read something once, so smart. I wish I'd saved it, but it was an article about how to be effective. Um, and they talked about how when we go to a grocery store, we will buy vegetables um, and, you know, put them in our fridge going like this week, I'm eating vegetables. I'm going to eat right for a change. And then those vegetables rot in the fridge because what's happening is we are flawed. We are assuming that the future version of ourselves is going to be far more effective, far more powerful, far uh, more ambitious than the current version of ourselves. And that's patently untrue. Like your future self is you. So this article said, in order to ensure success in the future, present you has to look out for future you by setting the table as flawlessly and perfectly as possible so that future you literally just has to walk into the room and have all the work's been done for that person already. And I understood that it was crystal clear in that moment. I was like, oh my God, 
in order to like it made sense i retrofitted it and i was like that's how clerks happen and now it's kind of how i move forward in everything i do man the idea is the future version of you is never going to be better than the present version of you it begins right here so if you want future you to eat vegetables guess what today you eat a vegetable if you want future you to be a filmmaker guess what today you're making a film you got to start it in the now future you is imperfect as imperfect as present you so you want future you to be perfect you got to make sure that that life is foolproof set up effectively for future you so that even if future you loses all intelligence and senses and becomes an idiot all they have to do is push a button and everything becomes manifest great point when i was 23 i came up with this monitor moniker brand yourself for the career you want not the job you have and the way i followed through was i would have a full-time job and then nights and weekends i would write and interview people and eventually it took about three and a half years to go out on my own but it was i was already becoming that person even though i couldn't during the work day so you can always find time to do you know, step by step, this one article, this one interview, this little production, uh, some little bit animation, anything you can do in your spare time, you can start to build day by day by day to eventually become what you set out to become. And I think that is such a powerful piece of advice because it is very tangible. It is what can you spend even a half hour doing today, every single day that will eventually accumulate and compound to enabling you to build the career that you would like to have, not the career that you're stuck in. Think of it like this, kids. Make yourself your hobby. Because we all collect hobbies and we spend a lot of time on those hobbies and doing things and whatnot. You should be your own best hobby. The idea of building that life of yours, not the present version of you, but the future version of you, making it foolproof for that cat. Be your own best hobby. Like don't waste time on somebody else's interests. Be self-interested. And I don't mean at the expense of all others. You know, look, I, I, I don't subscribe to any faith anymore, but I do love the idea of Christianity, not based on what Christ said, but just the idea that like, we're all in this together. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. These are simple philosophies that one doesn't have to believe in religion to adhere to and, and use in life and stuff. So create joy where you go, man. Like even if you're self-actualizing, it's not at the expense of others. You don't have to step on anyone's neck to get any higher in this life. And people that do that eventually fall and get stepped on themselves. So do it with grace, do it with, uh, with help. No one is alone in this. Collaborators are always essential. Um, and just, but more importantly than anything else, do it. Don't talk about it, do it. Do a thing. You'd be surprised how fun it is to have something to show for your time. Like most people won't ever get to say that in this lifetime. You have something uniquely yours that you own that wouldn't exist without you. And yeah, people can have children and that fulfills some part of that. But an artistic expression, a self-expression, I hesitate to use the word art because sometimes it scares people away. Go, I'm no artist. I said that for years and stuff. Fine. You're not an artist. Self-expression. Like to be able to hear, have your voice heard, to write on the wall so people know that you were here. You know, you don't have to make a dent in the universe as, as uh, you know, the uh, what's his name, Steve Jobs used to say, but you could still make some sort of impact. You could still write on the wall of life and let them know that you were here, man. And, and it don't last forever. You know, everything crumbles and eventually, you know, look, if anyone saw Coco, we understand the importance of remembering the dead. Otherwise they get forgotten and stuff like that. But for a little while, while you're here in this world, do that thing that you know you can do. You know you could do this. It's not, you're, some people have huge dreams, you know, like leaving this planet and stuff, you know, God bless. And, and some of them actually get to do it. But like, you know, the dream of making a movie, come on, that's not difficult. That just requires time and maybe a few dimes. And you can have both of those. You could do this, kids. Making a movie is one of the easiest things in the world. I say that as somebody who's done it a bunch of times and who's done it on his own dime and on the dime of others and stuff. Aim higher than that. But whatever you do, hopefully like it satisfies you and hopefully it satisfies somebody else as well. Like I love making Clerks 3, but I know what's going to come out of it. A couple lives are going to be saved. Just like by virtue of the fact that I went around and told a story about me having a heart attack, 
I heard feedback from so many people on social media. It was like, I heard your story and I went and checked my heart out. Good thing I did. I needed a stent. I was going to drop dead. So like make your work and in that work, hopefully other people could pull something from it. Not just inspiration to sing their song, but maybe some useful information about their own health as well. That's great advice. And thank you so much for being on the show, Kevin. Yeah, it's such a pleasure, man. So glad I showered.